Good morning, everyone. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath morning that we can come into your courts of praise. And we pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit's presence as we discuss this topic. We thank you for each person that is here. We pray that you may give me clarity of speech and mind and be with all of our listeners, Father, that they may be able to understand the principles that are being shared. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You know, last night we talked about um, the fact that we are in a great controversy. That's something we hear a lot in our church. And we focused even more on the fact that the controversy occurs in our mind for each one of us individually. Of course, there's a controversy in the universe, but for each one of us, the bigger picture or the most important part is that the controversy is occurring in our mind. And in this controversy, Satan seeks to have control of our minds. And he does this in various ways. And one of the ways that he does so, we talked about last night, is by seeking to mix truth and error. The first time he did this was in the Garden of Eden. We talked about when he um, came to Eve through the serpent and said, ye shall not surely die. In the day that you eat the fruit thereof, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods. And when you look at what he said to her, there was some truth there. Her eyes were opened and so was Adam's eyes. But at the same time, there was a lie. There was error, which said that ye shall not surely die. So we talked about that last night. And then we went into one particular area of psychology, and that is the idea that we have to understand and talk about childhood in order to be healed. And I looked at some of the error with that, and I looked at some of the problems that comes about when we focus on childhood as a way of healing, uh, especially as it re relates to how typical psychotherapy is done, which is what I did for most of the time that I was in private practice, and even before that, because before I was in practice, I taught on the university level, but at the side, I always counseled students at the particular counseling center for the universities where I worked. So the idea that um, was promoted, especially by Freud, is that we have to talk about childhood in order for healing to come. And we talked about last night how there are some errors with that. And one of the errors is that when you focus on the past, you don't move past the past. And there's something that actually happens physiologically when we focus on the past, that the neurosignatures in our brain are strengthened. And so we want to replace those neuro signatures, the things that happen with the nerves, the firing of the nerves. We want to replace that with something that will help us to grow and to help us to heal. We also talked about the fact that psychotherapy can sometimes prevent us from being, for being accountable for our behavior. We looked at a quote that talked about nowadays when young people do things, like we had the Columbine shooting, et cetera, psychologists and those of us who's taken on this type of thinking will often go back and say they did this because they came from a bad background or because they were bullied in school. Now, I did say last night, these things can't contribute, but my problem with it, and the problem should be for you as well, when we focus on these things, it, it moves away from our responsibility for our actions, amen? The other thing we talked about was the fact that sometimes God allows difficulties to come in our lives, not for us to run to a psychologist or a counselor, but for us to low and grow and to learn from these difficulties. And then I ended with talking about the fact that it is reality that people are hurting based on things that have happened to them. We can't run away from that. And someone said something to me last night that I thought was so true. There's the void in our churches of dealing with this. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have grabbed on to secular psychology so much, because there's not a place for people to go in our churches to receive the proper counsel. There are some ministers who are doing it, but many ministers have bought the idea that they have to have a PhD or a master's in psychology to be able to help people. And as a result of that, we're missing that particular area in our church. Um, and that's, that's a, a burden that I have. And, and the person who brought that up, I thought it was really important to state that. Now today we're gonna be talking about an, a couple of other concepts with psychology. And the first one is self-esteem. Self-esteem. You see this picture up here. This man is Carl Rogers, and he is one of the earliest people to really come up with and promote the idea of self-esteem, or he also you looked at it as a positive or negative self-concept. Carl Rogers. Let me tell you a little bit about Carl Rogers. He grew up in a religious family. I think he grew up here in California, if I'm not mistaken, because I met someone who actually met him before he passed. I think it was in the 90s. He made a decision to enter the ministry 
But um, at an experience at a particular youth conference, he found out that there were so many different religious worldviews and religious doctrines, and he began to doubt his parents' strict religious upbringing. So he did decide that he would go to seminary, but he went to a liberal seminary, and he found out that um, he needed to develop his own philosophy of life. This is Carl Rogers. He eventually decided to choose a career other than the ministry because he could not, I quote, work in a field where he would be required to believe in some religious doctrines. So guess what field he chose? Psychology. And Carl Rogers has contributed to a lot of the thinking that we have to develop as counselors when we go and learn about counseling. You've heard about, um, you may not have heard this term, reflective listening, unconditional positive regard, empathy, all of these things are good to an extent, and this is what we learn. The, the reflective listening, I used to um, joke with my friends about it. You've probably seen people do this. Somebody says something and you say, you sound like you're angry. <laughs> or someone says something else, you sound like that really hurts you. But the idea behind that for Carl Rogers is that as you reflect on what the person is saying, specifically focusing on their feelings, that this helps them to understand themselves better. And Carl Rogers came up with all of this. But in particular, what we want to talk about with him today is the idea of self-esteem and self-concept. And he believed that it is important for us to feel good about ourselves. He felt that a person who has a poor self-concept or a low self-esteem will act in a not healthy way or think in an unhealthy way or say things and feel in an unhealthy way. And some of that is true, my brothers and sisters. Remember, always remember, and I'm going to keep repeating this, the danger with some of these concepts is that there's a mixture of truth and error. It is true that how a person looks at themselves will affect how they respond, what they say, what they do, etc. So there's some truth to that. Um, with this type of thinking, however, some of our early psychologists, especially those who were instrumental in laying the field for uh, the foundation for the field of psychology, began to use this idea of self-esteem to negate some of our biblical principles. And here is an example of this. The doctrine that man is selfish and has nothing good in himself is not healthy and promotes self-hatred. Now, we as Christians believe what the Bible says. There is none good. There's none that doeth good. But if a psychologist who has a secular mindset will look at some of these verses, they would say, in your church, you promote something that's not healthy. You're promoting self-hatred. And so that idea is one that contradicts with the typical secular psychologist. Now, you can understand them thinking like this. A person who doesn't believe that there's a supreme being who can help, a person who promotes the idea that I have to help myself, it would make sense that they would look at verses like that in that way, amen? That makes sense to me. But for us as Christians, we have a different foundation. We have a different understanding that should help us know that God doesn't give us text to promote self-hatred. Amen? He gives us text to help us to be better people. Now, I want to look at how some of this thinking has come into the Christian church and to show a little more where secular psychology is dangerous. Look at this. Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. Is that what sin is, brothers and sisters? But it sounds good, doesn't it? If a person is robbed of self-esteem, that is sin, according to this particular person. And if I'm not mistaken, I think, well, I might not, I, I'm not sure. I, I was going to say I think this person is a person from our denomination, but I'm not exactly sure, so I'm not going to say that. All, I'll, all I will say is this is a Christian pastor who's made this comment. Let me put another one up for you. To be born again means we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image from inferiority to self-esteem. This is a famous person that's from here, I'm not gonna name that person, who stated this, that this is what it means to be born again. You see what the enemy is doing? He's taking our spiritual concepts and using self-esteem to explain spiritual or biblical concepts. 
And there are people who are promoting this type of thinking. And if you don't know the word of God, you can easily get pulled in by this kind of thinking because it sounds really good. These are just examples of how self-esteem has come in and affected us. Now, self-esteem, this idea has also affected our sermons. It's also affected our methods within the church. It's affected our worship. It's even affected the songs that we sing. You know that? Some of the songs we sing are affected by this idea that we have to promote self-esteem. Here's an, here's an example. So, uh, many of us, all of us should know this song. Um, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for what? Such a worm as I. Remember when that song was sung like that? But because we have to feel good about ourselves, this is how it's sung now. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for someone such as I. See the slight change there? If you're a worm, you're not going to feel real good about yourself, are you? But if you focus on, on someone such as I, that makes you feel a little better about yourself. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh, she is taking this too far. This is just, you know, trivial. But brothers and sisters, the enemy is not going to come at us with something bold. He's going to come imperceptibly and insidiously to change our thinking. That's what I want you to realize. Now, there was a quote I wanted to go back and look at that another person said before we move on. It, the person says, and this is a Christian psychologist, if I could write a prescription for the women of the world, I would provide each one of them with a healthy dose of self-esteem and personal worth. I have no doubt that this is their greatest need. Sounds good, but I don't think that this is our greatest need as women of the world. I think that the need is for Christ and for some other things that's more important. Now, um, let's move on here. Let's look at the contemporary Christian music movement. Now, the contemporary Christian music movement is, is, is a genre, is a type of musical style that's focused on matters with Christian faith. And just to give a little bit of background on the contemporary mu music movement, I wanted to just share that it started out with the Jesus movement of the um, 1960s and the 1970s. And um, originally the music was called Jesus music. About that time, many young people from the 60s, they were looking into believing into Jesus and they would come up with this Jesus music, you know, and they felt it was better than the drugs and, and the, the lifestyle. At first, it started out with songs about love and peace, and then it translated into songs about love of God. But as time moved on, this Jesus movement took in more of the rock, um, secular style of music, and thus we have Christian, contemporary Christian music. Now, in this movement, psychological principles have a lot to do with underlying some of the things that go on, and I have an example of he up here. In my own experience, this person was a part of the contemporary Christian music movement, by the way, and he left it, and he said, in my own experience, I noticed we contemporaries prefer to raise our faces and our hands up to God and call that worship. I thought back to when I first changed my personal worship style, this gentleman says, from bowing my head to looking up. And he goes on to say, I remember the good feeling it gave me that I was the first time, I was for the first time that I was, right, for the first time, a participant in worship with God, not some lowly, there's that word again, worm, who had to prostrate myself. I felt better about myself. So what this individual is saying, when he became involved with the contemporary Christian music movement and he could lift his hands and look up, look up to God, it was better than prostrating and putting, look, have his face looking down or falling on the ground. And it was, as a result, it made him feel better about himself. Do you see the self-esteem thinking coming in there again? It's about feeling better about self. And this worship style has become very popular within our churches and has, has affected many of us. Not only is the um, worship or the idea of self-esteem affecting worship, it's also affecting some of our writings. Um, and here's an, a specific example of that. This was a Sabbath school lesson we had. And, you know, God bless this Sabbath school writer. I'm sure that in the time that I used to think like this, I'm, I would have said the same thing. Listen to what he says. The first thing Jesus does is to tell Simon Peter the work he's going to have him do. Perhaps Jesus, knowing Peter's lack of what? Self-esteem, immediately told him of his important task in order to help Peter understand that although he was a sinner, 
Christ not only accepted him, but was going to trust him with important work. Now, when you read about the Peter that I read about in the Bible, would you say that Peter had low self-esteem? Actually, I think his problem was just the opposite. But because this thinking pervades our mind as Christians, last night I talked about putting on psychology's glasses to evaluate the scripture, and many of us do this. This Sabbath school writer, bless his heart, did the same thing and evaluated Peter as having a low self-esteem, and that's why Christ had to come to him and talk to him first. Do you see the error in that? But again, it's because of this thinking that we have to raise people's self-esteem. Now, if we look at some biblical characters, I don't have this on the board. I want, want you to do a little exercise with using your Bible. This is something I don't like about these PowerPoint presentations. I don't, I, sometimes I'm not good enough in getting people to use their Bible. I want you to turn to me with, to some verses. Turn with me to some verses. Genesis 18, 27 is the first verse I want us to look at. Genesis 18, verse 27. We're going to look at some biblical characters and see how much they promoted self-esteem. Genesis 18, 27. I'm going to read. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. That's what Abraham thought about himself. He was but dust and ashes. Let's look at another verse, Job 44. Job chapter 40 and verse 4. Job chapter 40 and verse 4. And Job says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay up my hand upon my mouth once I have spoken, but I will not answer yea twice, but I will proceed no farther. But further, but the part of this verse I really want us to focus on in terms of what we're talking about, he starts out by saying, by saying behold what? I am what? Vile. And there are other examples in the Bible. Remember the centurion who said to Jesus, I'm not worthy that you should come un under my roof? Now, if a psychologist were, were analyzing each of these people, what kind of um, analysis do you think they'd come up with? These people have what? Low self-esteem. But we recognize that that's not what's happening here. They recognize their true spiritual condition as, we go, as they're um, contrasted to God. So I just wanted to, to, to look at the Bible and see what is happening with, in terms of the self-esteem, if that's something that's really promoted. Now, the truth is that true greatness, the real Christian life, does not involve self-esteem but self-denial. That's what the true Christian life actually um, has us to, to do. And that's why in Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and tape up, take up his cross and follow me. This concept of self-denial and the way psychologists promote self-esteem, the twain do not meet. They're so completely different, brothers and sisters. Jesus didn't just arbitrarily come up with this principle of self-denial. Because of sin, God knows what is best for us to achieve the mind of Christ, to achieve true mental health. And so this idea of self-denial is one that we must grab onto as Christians. Remember, this is where Satan is seeking to deceive us. He doesn't want us to think that God's way and God's wisdom is the best. So he comes up with his own way. In addition to this teaching about self-denial is the biblical principle of dying to self. This is what we have to do to deny self, and which is why Paul stated in 1 Corinthians, I die daily. It's hard to die to self and also try to raise self-esteem. Hard to do the, the, the two together. I want you to look at some of the benefits of, of dying to self. Dying to self is the best way to deal with our self-image, we're told. When we are dead to self, we are, first of all, less hurt by criticism. We're less hurt by others who outperform us. We're less hurt by those who are more popular, those who don't like our ideas. The only way we can become invincible to this is if we crucify self and follow the humble pathway to Jesus. 
It's not by raising our self-esteem that we'll do this, brothers and sisters. It's by dying to self. And you know, it takes a whole paradigm shift. Guess what? We're so used to hearing what the world says about raise self-esteem, feel better about yourself. And when we pick up the Bible, it, it takes us by faith to completely change our paradigm and to say, Lord, I believe your way. Even though the world is telling me something different, I believe that your way of denying self, of dying to self, is going to actually not help me also spirit uh, only spiritually, but is also going to help me with my mental health. And we see that in this particular quote right here. And I hope that you're getting this as we talk, that God's way is the best. Paul also gives us an admonition in Philippians about how we should deal with self. And this is what he says in Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. What does he say? Read it with me. Let each esteem other better than themselves. And as we go on in this chapter, he talks about getting the mind of Christ. And this all fits into the mind of Christ that Christ wants us to have as well. So we actually should be seeking to esteem others better than ourselves, according to the biblical admonition. And this goes against some of what we've been taught. But I want you to ask God to help you if you're struggling with this, to really help you to, to accept his ways by faith. And I always admonish people, as I talk about these things, don't just run away and say, Dr. Park said this, Dr. Park said that. I want you to go home if you're really struggling with this, and even if you're not, and study out these principles for yourselves. I always say to people, if I've said something that you find in your study that doesn't make sense, throw it away. But I want you to make sure whatever you believe is grounded and based on God's principles. Amen? Now, I also wanted to talk about what the servant of the Lord says about esteem. We must realize that we are in Christ's school not to learn how we may esteem ourselves, but how we may cherish the what? Meekness of Christ. Self and selfishness will ever be striving for the mastery. It is a fight that we must have with ourselves that self shall not have the victory. Now, during the time that Ellen White wrote this quote, the concept of self-esteem wasn't really relevant because it didn't come up till probably 100 years or so after she wrote this. But I do believe by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, she understood that there are things we could do to try to promote self and lift self up and the Holy Spirit led her to write about it to help us understand that's not what our focus should be. We should be seeking to develop the humility and the meekness of Christ. Um, and so that's what I, I believe she was focusing on there. It's interesting to note that this thinking of self-esteem is even more prominent in our Western culture than the Eastern culture. Look at this. A Texas corporation aiming to improve productivity told its employees to look in the mirror and say, I'm beautiful 100 times before coming to work. In contrast, a Japanese supermarket instructed its employees to begin their, their day by telling each other, you are beautiful. Difference in perspective. America's really good at pushing this self-esteem and you got to feel good about yourself thing. But the sad thing, because of television and media and technology, is this idea is creeping into other cultures as well. But I thought I would just add that in there just to show you the contrast between how we live and how we think and the, that's more co uh, what's more common than some of the other um, cultures about self. You know that what I love about God's principles is that God is not a one-sided God, neither is he a, uh, a narrow God. Some who are looking through the natural eye may think that this is extreme, but the spiritual eye will understand that this is not. God doesn't want us to beat ourselves down to the ground, to debase ourselves in this quest not to esteem ourselves. I don't want you to walk away thinking that at all. This would be what Satan would want you to think, and many suffer because of this type of thinking. Look at what God's servant says about this. She says, the Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. He desires his chosen heritage to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. God wanted them, else he would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand to redeem. So what is this telling us? When the Lord, when the Lord sees us 
going around with our head down, I'm such a horrible person, I'm nothing, I'm, I'm nothing in the sight of God. I, he doesn't want this. He, he wants us to esteem ourselves, not based on how the world says we should esteem ourselves, but based on what he has done for us through Christ. Amen? So when we evaluate ourselves based on the cross, our self-estimation will be higher and even better than those who are not evaluating themselves based on this. Amen? So that's what I want you to, to, to point out. She also talks about the fact that we should be evaluating ourselves based on uh, the standards that we have. Our conscience, many of us are suffering from a poor conscience, and as a result of that, it's leading us not to feel um, good about ourselves or not to view ourselves the way Christ views us. And when I say a, a, a conscience, that's the part of our brain that tells us what is right and what is wrong. So we have to look at this when we're looking at self-esteem and self-concepts and self, um, concepts and self worth. You know, there are actually people in the psychological world who hasn't bought this concept of self-esteem. It's not just those of us who are Christians, those of us who look at the Bible and can see that this self-esteem concept is not um, uh, spiritual or not biblical, but it is also, by the world standards, those who are researchers. Last night I talked about the difference between those in the research world and those in the practitioner world for psychology. Remember that last night? Those in the research world sometimes laugh at us who don't look at research and science as um, we should uh, and in terms of how we evaluate and look at people. And so this is an example. When we look at some of the research and we look at some of the things that people are saying about self-esteem in the psychology world who hasn't bought this hype, we see some different things. I just want to have some examples I want to read. I don't necessarily have them on our slides. One thing that research it has shown is that high self-esteem in children does not produce better grades. Sometimes in the school systems, we've heard the teachers saying, you know, our children should have higher self-esteem, and if they have the higher self-esteem, then their grades will be better. The, th the science does not show this, brothers and sisters. Something else that science shows. Very violent people, groups, nations, think very well of themselves, have very high self-esteem versus what we may think that people are engaging in violent acts because they don't feel well about themselves. Research is not showing that. Another thing that is shown by research besides that is the fact that, um, according to the different studies, high self-esteem does not deter people from becoming bullies. In fact, it's shown that bullies have very high self-esteem. It doesn't discourage people from cheating, from stealing, from using drugs. All of these ideas were promoted when this self-esteem movement came about, that people were, you know, children were promiscuous and children use drugs and children fight more because they have low self-esteem. The research actually shows different. Other th another thing it shows is that high self-esteem only just makes people feel good but doesn't really have an impact on their behavior. It's all about what you feel and what you think about yourself. There was one psychologist not a Christian at all, who said something that I thought was so powerful. This is Dr. Robert Hogan. He's found that humility rather than self-esteem is a key trait of successful leaders. Humility. Doesn't the Bible show us that? That whole chapter on Philippians 2 is speaking about humility. And this psychologist, secular in mind, found that when he looked at the traits of um, successful leaders, humility is more important. Now, interestingly, the servant of the Lord made a simple statement that reflects some of these findings. Real simple sta statement. She says, nine-tenths of all our trouble comes from our esteeming ourselves too highly. That's 90% of our troubles, brothers and sisters. It comes from us looking and esteeming, looking at and esteeming ourselves too highly. Just imagine if we focus more on developing humility and meekness and focus more on another term I'm going to talk about in a little while, self-respect. Many of our problems would go away. I thought that was a powerful statement. Now, there was a study that was done on college students that I thought was interesting. College students who base their self-worth on external sources, including appearance, approval from others, 
and even academic performance, they reported high stress, they reported anger, academic problems, relationship conflicts, they had high levels of drug and alcohol use, and symptoms of eating disorders. These were students who based their self-worth on outside things. They had supposedly high self-esteem. The study goes on to find students who base their self-esteem on internal sources, such as being a virtuous person or adhering to moral standards, were found to have higher grades and were less likely to use alcohol and drugs or to develop eating disorders. See what's going on here? Basing their self-worth on outer things caused them to have more problems than basing their self-worth on being virtuous and adhering to standards morally. And listen to what the secular psychologists concluded from this study. We really think that if people could adopt goals, not focus on their own self-esteem, but on something larger than self, then they would be less susceptible to some of the negative effects of pursuing self-esteem. I just love it when research vindicates God's word. We don't need it to do that but I like it. And it, it actually, I find it helpful when I'm talking to people who may not be Christians, who don't want to hear biblical principles, when I can pull out the science and say, look, look at what science shows. Then I've found oftentimes they're more open, open to find out and hear what God says. Because I say to them, you know, God's word says the same thing that science shows. It's a powerful tool, and God, I believe, is using science more and more to confirm, you know, we don't need it to confirm, but to show that his principles are true. And I thought this study was a very interesting one. Now, um, the Lord echoed uh, through his servants something similar to the findings of this study, and I mentioned it a little earlier, over 100 years ago, before the study was done, and she said this, it is, not displeasing to, it is not pleasing to God that you should demerit yourself. You should cultivate a self-respect by living so that you will be approved by your own conscience and before men and angels. While we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, the word of God does not condemn a proper self-respect. As sons and daughters of God, we should have a conscious dignity of character in which pride and self-importance have no part. I referred to this a little earlier. The fact that living based on what your conscience tells you, and let me add this little piece. You can't just be based on what your conscience tell you. It has to be a conscience that's been educated by the word of God. I was talking to someone the other day, this is just an aside, a young person, talking to them about some principles, and she says, my conscience doesn't bother me when I'm doing such and such. Some of the things you're telling me that God wants me to do, my conscience doesn't bother me. And I said, the only way that you can trust your conscience is if your conscience has been uh, tested and proved by God's word. So this idea that, you know, I did this, my conscience doesn't bother me, so it's okay, that's not always safe. But the conscience has to be one that is validated by God's word. But she's saying here that we should cultivate a self-respect. There's a whole chapter, I believe it's a whole chapter, a whole section in Mind, Character, and Personality where the servant of the Lord talks about self-respect. Do you know in, um, when we're dealing with sometimes the urban community and, and inner city, young people, et cetera, there was a push one time for, for us to say, to do things that would raise their self-esteem. But actually, what we really need to be doing is helping these young people raise their self-respect. And in my character and personality, I don't know the exact quote, she talks about the fact that one of the ways to raise self-respect, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, the principle is the same, is to teach people skills. And when we're dealing with people who are, dealing, who, who, who are engaging in behaviors that are problematic, teach them some skills. Teach these young people skills. I read about programs sometimes. In fact, I just read when I was flying here yesterday, I read about a program where a woman in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania somewhere had horse stables, and she brought many of these inner city kids over to learn about um, raising horses and riding horses. Some of them ended up in polo competitions, et cetera. But the idea was many of these young people ended up doing well in life, not because she's sought to raise their self-esteem, but because she's taught to, to teach them some type of skill. 
where they could feel as though they can be productive and give something back to society. So self-respect is very important, much more important than self-esteem. What is self-respect? It's a proper sense of one's own dignity and one's own integri integrity. It differs from self-esteem because it focuses more on what we can do to um, make sure that we are respectful or respectable in our, in, as we relate to other people. And self-esteem just looks at gaining a favorable opinion about yourself, which may make you feel good, but it won't necessarily translate into different behaviors. Now, last night I mentioned someone who I greatly respect, Pastor Dan Gabbard. He is a Christian counselor, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian counselor, trained as a pastor, and he works at Black Hills Health and Education Center. And last not I mentioned that he came up with something known as biblical response therapy. And he has a, a good delineation of the difference between self-esteem and self-respect that I wanted to share with you. Self-esteem self <coughs> self focuses on self, whereas self-respect focuses upon God. Self-esteem is self-centered thinking, while self-respect is God-centered thinking. See the difference? Focusing on self versus focusing on God. Self-esteem, you see yourself as a person who, as others see you, and as a person who is um, a prized possession. On the other hand, self-respect sees me as God sees me as his prized possession, regardless of how I feel uh, others see me. Self-esteem trusts in self to protect self, while self-respect trusts in God to protect self. I hope you're seeing the difference here. Difference here. Self-esteem lives to honor or glorify self. Self-respect looks at living to honor or glorify God. Do you all see the differences there? Focusing on self, focus, focusing on God, self-centered thinking versus what God thinks of me and how God evaluates me. Looking myself at myself as uh, how others sees me versus looking at myself at how God sees me. And then living to honor and glorify God versus living to honor and glorify self. I thought this was really powerful in terms of comparing the difference between self-esteem, self-respect. You know, I've had some people come to me and say, what you're saying is just semantics because Really, you could use these words interchangeably. That might be true, but my point is what I said earlier. We, I want to look at the subtle, imperceptible ways that Satan comes in to, to modify and change our thinking, and I think we can't ignore the fact that he has come in to try to change God's way of how we look at self. It might seem small to you, but in the long run, it has some large ramifications. Now, I'm going to put self-esteem and self uh, 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 that whole idea to the side right now. We're gonna look at another concept in psychology as it relates to the dangers of secular psychology, and that's the whole area of needs. It's true that as human beings, we all have various emotional, social, and mental needs. God created us this way, amen? In psychology, th there are different psychologists who define the various needs we have as human beings. One such person is Maslow. Put up your hand if you've heard of Abraham Maslow. He's come up with a hierarchy of needs. The bottom needs is physiological needs. Then we have safety needs. Then we have the need for love and belongingness. And the highest needs is self-actualization. And Maslow says that if you don't um, fulfill the lower needs, you won't focus too much on the higher needs. There's some truth to that. If a person is hungry and you see that they're hungry, I'm not going to go to them and start preaching the three angels' message, right? You know, immediately, I should say. I might want to do it in addition to feeding them. So there's some truth to what Maslow is saying, that when these other needs are not met, you're not as focused on the higher needs. However, I see what has happened in, in Christianity. What has happened is, even in our church, we've come up with different ministries, different programs, different departments that are kind of based on this thinking. And sometimes we don't move past the lower needs. What I mean by that is, we come up with women's ministries, children's ministries, family life, and I think sometimes we forget that people are in church to grow spiritually and not just fulfill needs. Are y'all following me? And this is a burden that I have with all of these different ministries and departments. We get so focused on the needs of the particular ministry 
the particular group that we're ministering to, that we forget that our ultimate goal is for people to grow spiritually. I saw an example of this. My girlfriend, was, she gave me an example of this. She went to a particular church and she wanted to help them with community services. And to you all, this, you might not seem this is like a big thing, but it was for me because of the thinking that I have. She says, you know, Magna, we give out all these, these clothing, this, these food, the hot meals and everything. I rarely hear people talking to these people about Christ. I rarely hear them talking to them about their need for a savior. We're really good in feeding, feeding the hungry and clothing them, etc. but we sometimes fail in the aspects of pointing them to Jesus. Have you all seen this in some of our ministries? I'm not knocking these ministries. I think they're very important, but I think sometimes we kind of get our priorities a little mixed up. And I think some of this is because of this thinking that we get from secular psychology that we have to fulfill needs. You know, and even with dealing with people who are unchurched, this, uh, this thinking has come in. Um, this is some more self-esteem self -esteem and self-respect things that I didn't put up there, but we're gonna move on because our time is kind of um, moving away from us here. Um, I wanted to put this particular quote up. If you are for unfor or fortunate enough to have the unchurched visit your congregation, realize that the best way to ensure that they will return is to do what the church has been called to do, love them. In practical terms, this means being sensitive to their what? Felt needs. You know the difference between felt needs and real needs? Felt needs are the needs that you can't really touch or the needs that says, I have to have this in order to be such and such and such and such. Let me make this more clear. Physical needs is what we really need to be focusing on. Clothing people, feeding them, you know, helping families, etc. that's important. But sometimes felt needs get very subjective. People leave the churches because felt needs are not met. You know, I didn't feel as though I belonged, or people didn't treat me well, or she looked at me the wrong way. And some of these things, brothers and sisters, we have to be careful with in, in relating to one another. I'm not negating that. But felt needs can get us in trouble if we make all our decisions based on whether our felt needs are met or not. Are you all following me? We have to have focus on needs that are really there, and our ultimate need actually is the need for God. Now. This kind of thinking about ministering to, to felt needs has, has affected our church in, vi in various ways. Look at this. Sometimes we have to even cater our sermons and services to this. This is what, what per one person says. Limit your preaching to roughly 20 minutes because boomers, baby boomers, don't have much time to spare. And don't forget to keep your messages light and informal, liberally sprinkling, sprinkling them with humor and personal anecdotes. Have y'all seen these kind of churches? They exist. They're administering to felt needs. They're catering to felt, ne felt needs, I should say. Another example of this, using the style of music. We use the style of music that the majority of the people in our church listen to on the radio. They like bright, happy, cheerful music with a strong beat. Their ears are accustomed to music with a strong bass line and rhythm. And the idea is meet them with their felt needs, their felt needs for this kind of music. And that way, our churches will grow. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Church and churches that are doing this are growing. They really are growing. So no, no, let you not be confused or deceived. These methods work if we're only looking at getting bodies into the church. If we minister to their felt needs, they will come in. But we, if we understand the Bible, recognize that it's more than just numbers. And when I'm going to talk about that in one of my um, seminars, that we're going to be looking at the fact that God doesn't evaluate us based on the numbers that we have. He evaluates us based on where we are spiritually in the church. So these are just some examples of how this needs-based thing is kind of catering, uh, uh, leading us to cater our music and our, and our services in a way that will um, fulfill these felt needs. I must continue to repeat this. The appeal of such thinking is there because there's error mixed with truth in it. I keep saying this, and I want you to recognize this. When Jesus was on this earth, he did not ignore people's needs. He did cater to their needs. There were things that he did to show that. The Savior mingled with the men, as we're told in Ministry of Healing, as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he did what? Bathed them 
follow me. In Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, we see an example of a Savior who is concerned about the needs of people. The disciples wanted to send them away, remember? But he was concerned about the fact that they had been sitting or standing all day long, listening to him speaking, and he wanted to fulfill their needs. So this idea about fulfilling needs, brothers and sisters, is not wrong. But then, look at what this quote says. Not only did he fulfill their needs, but he said at the end, follow me. And that's the point that I'm making. If we're not making sure that in fulfilling people's needs that we're not leading them to Christ and encouraging them to follow Christ, we're just doing what secular psychology says, make sure that their needs are met in order for them to grow and to move forward. And we're not doing what God has told us to do. And that is to meet, reach people not only with their physical needs, but with their spiritual needs. Christ's main focus was on helping people to be drawn to to God, and he didn't just stop at meeting their needs. I heard Pastor Mark Finley say, this was powerful to me, in John 6, Jesus revealed that he's not merely a miracle worker. He was not simply one who came to meet their physical needs. The prime purpose of his ministry was to meet the inner spiritual needs of people. And how did they respond when he really told them what he came for? Do you remember in John 6? Many of them turned away. When Jesus actually said some things that helped them to realize what they're in this for, it's not just ministering to their needs, many of them turned away. And sometimes if we follow that same perspective, we may not get the numbers, brothers and sisters, and many may turn away as well. But our goal is to make sure that we're following what the Bible says and not only looking at how people are responding. My fear is that we become so needs focus too, that people are ending up looking to God merely as a person to fulfill needs, and they don't move past this to develop a relationship with him and to develop their characters. Look at this particular quote. The Christian church has eagerly adopted the language of needs for itself. We now hear that Jesus will what? Meet your every need, as though he was some kind of divine psychiatrist, or a divine detergent as though God were simply to service us. When we encourage people to focus on these felt needs, their whole view of God becomes one of, let me put this nickel into the um, candy dispensing machine and I'll get candy. Y'all, are y'all following me? God is just there to fulfill our needs and we don't grow much. That kind of thinking doesn't help a person really grow in their spiritual walk with the Lord. I don't know if I should say this because this may be televised, but I'll say it. Um, I have a concern about that in some of our um, African-American communities with some of the, the focuses that we have and our services and all of that. I see happening sometimes that we want people so badly to come into the church, and um, a lot of times we, f we may focus on the lower income, that we focus so much on making sure they fulfill their needs. Even some of our songs, to me, I used to call them um, social gospel songs, where it's focused upon, you know, Jesus will be there, Jesus will be there, he'll, 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 he'll pay my bills, he'll be there for me all the time. You know, some of the gospel songs focus on that. And I have a fear that sometimes that kind of perspective doesn't bring people up higher than they should be. Are you all following me? And I'm not saying this to knock my own brothers and sisters, but because of the fact that we're one of the more disenfranchised groups in society, Satan, I think, takes that to keep people down to a certain level and not bring us up higher. That's the point that I'm making. And some of the songs that are geared towards more uh, of some of our groups and, and our people and some of the things that we do may help them in some ways, but in other ways may hurt them. And that's a real burden I have on my heart. So sometimes this needs focus can help us look at, at God as someone who always fulfills our needs and not as someone who can change us and to make us live better lives. Now, some people believe the idea that in order to grow spiritually, we are supposed to make sure that needs are fulfilled and that we won't sin if needs are fulfilled or we won't do the things that we shouldn't do, I should say, if needs are not fulfilled. Was that true for Adam and Eve? Did God fulfill all their needs? Did they end up falling? This quote kind of says it really well. Many Christians believe the humanistic lie that when people's needs are met, they will be good, loving people. Through the influence of humanistic psychology, they believe that people sin because their needs are not met. However, scripture does not bear this out. Adam and Eve had it all. 
yet they chose to sin. The Bible places God's will and purpose at the center rather than so-called psychological needs. You talk about a perfect place where all needs, felt needs, apparent needs, physical needs, a place where all of these needs were met, but still our first parents ended up sinning. That should let us know that even when we fulfill all these needs, if that's the focus that we're engaging in, if they, if they could do that in a perfect environment, imagine in our imperfect world, brothers and sisters. So this needs focus, we have to put it in perspective. That's what I want you to hear. Don't stop your ministries. Don't stop ministering to women, ministering to, 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 to family issues, ministering to young people, you know. But don't use these departments as a way to just fulfill needs and not point people towards Christ. Amen? That's what I want you to get from all of this. If you're a head of a ministry of a, of a department, I want you to, to really think about the fact that these ministries can sometimes get off base. You know, in a future presentation, I'm going to um, mention this quote by the servant of the Lord in Welfare Ministry. She says that this work of Isaiah 58, where, where they talk about the true fast, are you all familiar with that verse? She says that sometimes it's not placed in its right place. And sometimes we as people who are to proclaim the third angel's message, we put these needs and they supersede us proclaiming the three angels' message. And we have to be ever careful with that. I remember sitting in Sabbath school one time and we were talking about how we can do better as a church. And one person was saying, you know, we should feed hungry people more. We should be having more programs to teach literacy. We should have programs to help people fin finish their GA G GED and on and on and on. And I raised my hand and I said, these programs are wonderful. I think it's great that we want to do this. But my only question is, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, when we do these programs, what makes us different than the other churches who are doing these programs? What makes us different? I think the difference should be is that we have these added pieces when the people come to us. That we have the added pieces, whether it be giving them tracts, whether it be giving them books, whether it be inviting them back to a Bible study. But we have to make sure that our priorities are placed in the right place, brothers and sisters. If there's nothing else you get from this talk about needs, is that. I want you to understand with all your departments, with all your programs, with the young people, for the single people, it should not only be about giving them a good time and making them sure they stay in the church, you know, fulfilling their needs. It should be about pointing them to Christ. If they stay in the church, but they don't develop spiritually, what have we done, brothers and sisters? All we've done is fulfill needs, but we haven't drawn people to Christ, which is completely different, as we talked about earlier, than what Christ did when he sought to fulfill people's needs. Now, oftentimes, after I do these type of presentations on needs, I have leaders coming to me. Are you telling me I should get rid of my single ministry department? Are you telling me we shouldn't have a family life department? I hope that's not what you're getting from this. I'm saying to really sit down and restructure and think about how these programs are being structured so we won't lose sight of the goal, of the direction that God ha wants us to have with these different ministries. And this will make more sense when we, when we talk a little later. I'm going to talk about moving away from the dangers of secular psychology. We must help one another. We can't ignore the fact that we are our brother's tr uh, keepers. It's true that we have to minister to needs. But just, let's just make sure that the needs that we focus on is the one that God wants us to focus on. And this is key to this. Read this verse with me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We don't believe that, do we? I don't think we do because we have it kind of turned upside down. If I seek my knees first, uh, then God can come a little afterwards. But God, Jesus, Matt, in, in, in Matthew, Jesus tells us something completely different. You know, I have, a, I, could, I have a special need that I'm praying for right now, and I've been praying and praying and praying, and one day the Holy Spirit said to me, did you forget about Matthew 6.33, Magna? To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's a piece we all, often um, leave out, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me, and I had to just bow and repent and say, Lord, I haven't remembered this. So now my prayer is not so much this particular need I have, but my prayer is, Lord, help me to seek you. Help me to seek your righteousness. Help me to, by faith, to believe that if I do this, this particular need that I have will be fulfilled. And if it's not, because I'm seeking you and your righteousness, it'll be okay. 
And that's what I want you to be able to walk away from when we think about needs. So today we've looked at self-esteem, we've looked at needs. My prayer is that when you're hearing these different bu buzzwords that's going around, even in the Christian world, that's what I want you to do at the, at the end of all of these series. I want you to go back and say, you know, this sounds good, but does this fit what the Bible tells me about how I should be viewing myself? Does this fit about what the Bible tells me about how needs should be met? If you do that as a result of this, then my trip to Fresno will not be in vain. Amen? Amen? So that is what my prayer is for you. I encourage you to come back as we continue these series on the dangers of secular psychology. And I want to publicly thank Pastor Stephen Bohr for allowing me to come here and present this to you. And for his um, assistant, Sister Eileen Pyburn, for all that she did to get me here. And I, I thank him for that. And I pray that these will be a blessing to you. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Bow with me. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for the principles of your word. These principles are practical. These principles are ones that we can base our foundation on. And we thank you that you've given them to us that we can be better people to each other and better people in this world. Father, we pray that we may learn that our self-worth is based on you and what you've done for us. We pray that we may recognize that for all the needs we have, if we seek you first and your righteousness, you will grant these needs according to your will. We pray for each precious person who's listening right now, Father, if they're dealing with these concerns, that you may help them to turn to your word and recognize that in your word is healing, in your word is truth. Thank you again for this time and for this privilege of being able to come before you. In the name of Jesus, your son, we do pray. Amen.